I'm Adam Pascarella, and welcome to episode 26 of The Power of Bold. From New York City, it's The Power of Bold, a podcast on risk-taking, entrepreneurship, and bold living. Join us as we interview world-class performers, analyze life-changing books, and gather actionable insights to help you achieve your goals. Here's your host, Adam Pascarella. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to this latest episode of The Power of Bold. We're on to episode 26 of the podcast, and I'm pleased to bring you my interview with Alan Gannett. Alan has a truly impressive resume. He's the founder and CEO of a company called TrackMaven, which is a marketing analytics software company based in Washington, D.C. Alan founded the company when he was 21 years old, and he was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 list in 2016. Alan also recently released a book titled The Creative Curve, How to Develop the Right Idea at the Right Time. It's a great book on the mythology of creativity and how we can ride the so-called creative curve to generate ideas that are both familiar yet novel at the same time. Alan is deeply familiar with the science and theory of creativity, and he provided some tips on how we can all be more creative in our own lives. I spoke with Alan on a stormy afternoon in New York City. In our conversation, we discussed why some of the myths about creativity are plainly false, what the creative curve is and how it works, why there is a false comparison between consumption and creativity, and why constraints can be some of the most liberating things in your search for creative ideas. Alan has a lot of insightful things to say about creativity, so I know you're going to enjoy the interview. Whether you think you don't have a creative bone in your body, or if you're confident in your creative abilities. Okay, here's my discussion with Alan Gannett. My guest today is Alan Gannett, the founder and CEO of TrackMaven, and the author of The Creative Curve, How to Develop the Right Idea at the Right Time. Alan, thanks so much for joining me on The Power of Bold. Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to talk about this stuff. I have some bold coffee here. You know, I'm ready. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad to hear it. So uh, just to start off, I, I enjoy studying the science of creativity and, and how we can all become more creative. But having said that, I think many people seem to think that they're either born with it or they aren't. And, and your book does a great job in first dispelling that myth. And then second, providing a framework that people can adopt to become more creative in their own lives. So I think that's really cool. But, but to start off, before we get into the meat of the book, I'd like to discuss your story itself. I think it's really interesting. So before you did all of this work, before you published this awesome book, did you think of yourself as a creative person? Totally, yes. Yeah. So I've been doing entrepreneurial things for a long time, and I've always had the view that creativity is not just about the arts or music, but really about that you know thing that we do as humans where we create things that are new and they're valuable. They're useful to society, and but they're also novel and they're also interesting. And so as an entrepreneur, I've always sort of viewed myself that way. And I always sort of get surprised when people have a very sort of narrow definition of creativity. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, say your, your childhood, um, grade school, high school, what could you give an example of, of how you applied that idea of creativity, whether that was a project you worked on or, or something in school, anything like that? Yeah. So, I mean, I was always sort of tinkering. I mean, I was um, an only child of like heavily divorced parents who both worked full time. And so I was by myself a lot. And so I just I think I learned how to be self-reliant and learned how to you know problem solve myself um, because of the sort of structure that was around me. But I think that was you know, much the result of sort of the conditions I was placed in than anything else. And so um, I was always tinkering. I, you know, created businesses as a kid. I, for some reason, had a penchant for creating um, media, media related stuff. Um, so I started in fourth grade a print newspaper for my school. Oh, really? This was clearly after print was dead. So that was stupid. <laughs> and then uh, in sixth grade, it turned into a website. And then when I was 16, I started a print music magazine again well after print was dead um and that also eventually turned into a website so i'm definitely stubborn <laughs> so your your idea of creativity it sounds like is associated with tinkering i think you said that exact word you're just kind of experimenting trying different things you're, you're not waiting for some idea to, to fall from the sky or hit you in the head or anything like that 
And I yeah, think- exactly. And part of the book is this idea that I think we have this vision of creatives and especially creative achievers as these people who are struck with these moments of inspiration. And the reality is that when you actually look at the science around creativity, the real histories around creativity, you find that it's really the stories of process, of iterations, of hard work. And I think people people have this sort of fanciful notion that really just comes from sort of movies and bad television. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it seems like people are, are waiting just, just kind of for an idea to, to strike and, and to go from there. But meanwhile, your book makes a good argument that it's all about, like you said, that iterative process and, and just grinding, keep keep working. And, and I think one of the best vignettes to, to describe that is when you talk about the Beatles. You have a bunch of stories about the Beatles. And specifically, I think it was um, Yesterday, the, the song Yesterday, how it was created. Um, just, a lot, I guess the, the consensus is that it just hit Paul McCartney one day and he kind of just played it on the piano and, and that was that, but it, it really wasn't the case. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So Paul McCartney and yesterday is sort of this like famous creativity story that if you talk about creativity, it's one of these sort of like aha moments of the century. Yesterday went on to be become the most recorded song of all time. And how the story goes is that Paul McCartney literally woke up with the song yesterday from a dream. He literally dreamed up this melody. And it's a story that's told about how, wow, look, creativity is magical and mystical and look at all this stuff. But the reality is that the story of yesterday is not the story of a flash of genius. It's actually the story of lots of preparation, lots of hard work. Paul McCartney for years before that was surrounded by music. He was constantly ingesting music. He literally played in a cover band for years. Mm -hmm. And then what he really dreamed was just six notes of a melody. Mm -hmm. And from there it took 20 months to zero to actually go from those six notes to a completed song. And so this idea we have of yesterday is this example, this sort of canonical example of, look, creativity is magical, is really not the story of that at all. And you see this again and again. You know, there's a story of J.K. Rowling being hit with the idea for Harry Potter on a train. And the reality is she dreamed up the characters and then it took her five years to write the first book. And so creativity really is the result of hard, thoughtful work, not just hard work, because lots of people work hard but hard, thoughtful work. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that society fixates on these, these lightning strike moments? It, I guess just another way to think about it is it doesn't really make sense, right? Because if if people are just waiting around for, for lightning to, to hit them, it seems like creativity is just so random. Meanwhile, your book, you, you advocate for this, this process that you can follow. And it's really, it's a way of democratizing creativity. I think that's more of an inspirational message than just waiting for lightning to strike. strike. So, so why do you think society fixates on that, that inspiration well, theme? I think it's the same reason why we like the lottery. I mean, I think we like the idea that in society you can sort of be bestowed with profound riches and it can sort of happen randomly to anyone. And I think just thinks the opposite about that message but it also has a negative, dark underside. It's also the underside of, well, if you're not experiencing these aha moments, then, well, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that's just not true. It's not true. The the reality is that the people who are creative achievers are very diligent, hard workers. They spend huge amounts of time on what they're doing. And the result of lots and lots of consumption and information ingestion and practice and skill means that the right hemisphere of their brain, where we have aha moments, has a lot of material to work with. And that's what causes them to be, quote unquote, inspired. And so I really think that the challenge that I have for people is I need them to change their mindset. Mm. I need them to stop thinking that, well, for some people it's easy and for me it's not easy. So I might just not be able to do it. The reality is that for everyone, it's hard in the beginning. Just these creatives you hear and you talk about, they often started very young when they had pressure of a helicopter parent pushing them through the hard part. And so you're not going to find something that's easy at the start. The only thing that's easy at the start is video games because they're designed to be that. (laughs) And so I think we have to be very careful in our society when we talk about things like finding our passions and all this stuff because I sometimes worry that these are all code words for find something that's easy. Mm. Mm, Interesting. And and I I meant to ask you, so there may be some listeners here that – I think you know what this is. This is so fuzzy. There's, I've, I'm not an artist. I, I don't create on the side. There's really no hope for me to, to be creative whatsoever. And, and clearly, you have a, a different message in that. How, how would you? 
convince them just just kind of what you said that it doesn't come easy for anyone and that you just everyone has to put in work we've been studying creativity for years right so creativity is not an understudied phenomenon but for some reason in our society the images of creativity we have are not the ones that come from the social sciences and the hard sciences but rather from movies and television and the cover of fast company and the reality is that what science shows us when it comes to creativity is that creativity is a learnable, nurturable skill. And basically, as long as you have a reasonable IQ or higher, not a genius IQ, but like an IQ of around 100, which is about half the world, you have the same creative potential as everyone else. Um, And this is like, this is, we're talking about billions and billions and billions of people. So what I'm fascinated by is why is there this gap between creative potential and creative achievement? And how do we close that gap? Because I think the big cause of that gap is really how we parent and how we educate. We drive kids away from creative fields. You've heard the stories like, oh, like, you know, if you get an English degree, you'll become a barista. And this sort of signaling to children is really dangerous. I mean, one, it's signaling that, you know, creativity equals poor. And second, it signals that money is the most important thing. And um, these are scary things that we sort of signal out there, and especially because in the future, when we're going to a world where we have AI and automation of high skill white collar jobs, I mean, creativity is the most the most future proof set of skills. And so it's imperative that people learn creativity skills. Mm-hmm. Just just kind of on a tangent here, as far as creativity and, and AI, I think that's pretty interesting as well. And you, I think there was some some AI system that developed, uh, you know, a painting that was considered beautiful by people. I could be getting that totally wrong, <laughs> but just just with with the rise of AI and big data and things like that, like like you said, this this uh, the importance of creativity is going to be even more relevant, right? Like it's it's something you need to to learn in school or at least learn on on the side. Correct. And, you know, if you want to be able to you know, have a career for the next, you know, 20, 30, 50 years, maybe if you're very young, um, the reality is that jobs that you never thought could be automated are going to be automated. And the pace in which automation is going to happen is going to be terrifying. And, you know, the things that are going to be hardest are going to be things that incorporate creative skills, because even though we can teach machines um, things that appear to be creativity, when you talk to AI researchers, like those are the things that's going to take the longest to master. So, mm-hmm. right, right. And if I can ask, I, I think there's this. I guess stigma is is the right word, or maybe there's a different word. But this this idea of creativity and feels like law, finance, consulting, as as opposed to to music or film or or something like that. And and I'm a former lawyer. I worked at a big corporate law firm. And and these type of feel in these type of fields, it seems like there's a defined way of doing things that. You know, you should follow precedent, especially in the legal field, um, follow what your superiors have done. And, and that's kind of the way it is. And and coloring outside the line, so to speak, is, isn't necessarily encouraged. So I, I guess first, what would you advise to a person in that situation if they have a creative idea and they want to, to float it to their boss or float it to someone else within their company? Yeah, so I have a couple thoughts. I mean, one is that I think creativity is actually most valuable in organizations where it doesn't seem like it would be valuable. Think about insurance or law, because those are actually the industries that have um, the biggest opportunity for change. I mean, being a creative at Google is like great. Like you're creative at Google. So is everyone else. Like it's like you're one of a whole army of people. And so I think at the end of the day, let's say your insurance or IT or law, there's a huge opportunity to leverage creativity. That's one. Second, in terms of how do you get your boss to actually allow you to push boundaries and allow you to do new things, I really think it's about making something very small. Take your experiment, whatever you want to do, and make it as tiny, tiny, tiny as possible. Because what you're trying to show is you're not trying to demonstrate that you were able to create this big innovation. You're simply trying to show that innovation has value. That's the argument you're trying to persuade of. And so I think the way to do that is just shrink your creativity. So let's say, for example, you're a marketer in IT and you want to start doing content marketing. Well, the thing to do is not go and pitch this massive, gigantic content marketing campaign. It's pitch one white paper, pitch Mm -hmm. one small video, make it low cost, make it low time effort, do it on your own time and prove that creativity has value in your organization because at the end of the day, these organizations which seem very staid are often very numbers driven. So if you can show the numbers behind creativity, that's where you can get a lot more uh, permission. Mm-hmm. 
So yeah, once again, just starting small and and trying to convince maybe, maybe one person instead of the whole company. Obviously, just starting out small, even with the people that you speak with, and then then get some momentum from from one hundred percent. Yeah, I, I guess excluding the the overarching argument or fallacy that many people don't think that they can be creative. What's what's another common fallacy that you see when people think about creativity? Well, I think one of the things when it comes to creativity is that people think it's very linear, right? So they think you go from idea to execution. And in fact, one of the things I'm talking about in the book is that the best creators understand that they're creating for an audience. They're not creating for themselves. When you hear people say, oh, I create for myself, that to me is really code word for no one likes my creativity. Mm -hmm. The most successful creative achievers understand the social dynamic of creativity. They understand they're creating for an audience. And as a result, they're willing to get feedback early and often and use that to iterate on their creative products. They're not just saying, I'm going to go into a cabin in the woods and I'm going to write this great American novel and I'm only going to come out once I write the words at the end. No, they have feedback readers. They have lots and lots of people dig in. They want to get people's opinion because they realize that at the end of the day, your job as a creative is to create something that resonates with an audience. We often get confused when it comes to creativity between what sociologists call little c creativity and big c creativity. Little c creativity is really productivity. It's creating something that's new, that's novel, but what we actually care about when it comes to creativity is capital C creativity. That's creativity where you create something that's both novel and valuable. Mm-hmm. Right. We want to create the painting that has an impact. We want to create the painting or the piece of art or the piece of marketing that actually changes minds. We just don't want to create something new. That's just productivity. And so I think oftentimes we get those two things wrong. And when you realize that your job as a creative is to create something that's both new and valuable, that's when you start to get much better at listening to your audience and incorporating them in your process. I, associated with that, I, I suppose some people would maybe think of Steve Jobs. He's the stereotypical example of someone that <laughs> that said, "You know what? I know what the audience wants. I, I don't uh, don't necessarily need their feedback." Versus, is that an accurate description? And how would you respond to people that think of Steve Jobs? And oh, I think this is a great example because Steve Jobs. I and mean, this was like mostly all talk. I mean, you look at Steve Jobs when he sort of um, went too far from the lines; it failed. I mean, you look at the Apple Newton, the PDA they made in the early 90s. I mean, it had lots of features. It was technically very impressive, but it wasn't the right idea at the right time. The audience wasn't ready for it. Now, on the other hand, when you look at the innovations that they did later in Apple during sort of the 2000s and 2010s, what they did was really iterative. I mean, the iPod was a better MP3 player. The iPhone was an iPod with a phone. The iPad was was an iPhone without the phone, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you see is that when you actually look at Apple's true success, it's not the story of radical innovation. It's actually a story of iterative innovation. And this comes down to a lot of the psychology we know about what drives human preference. And what scientists have found is that human preference is really dominated by these two or on one hand as people we're driven to things that are familiar we like things that are familiar because they make us feel safe and the unfamiliar feels scary if you were a cave dweller you want to go into a cave you've never been before because you might die Mm -hmm. now on the other hand we have this other urge we also seek out the novel the new we are looking for things that are radically different because we like new sources of pleasure, of reward. When we were a hunter-gatherer, we were looking for that next meal. And so these two contradictory urges, the desire for the familiar and the desire for the new, what they really are, that contradiction is our brain's really elegant way of balancing risk and reward. We like ideas that are familiar enough to be safe, but novel enough to be interesting. We don't like ideas that are radically new. And so the result is when you look at creative products, whether it's uh, a movie or the iPhone, we actually gravitate to things that are one foot in the familiar and one foot in the novel. And so you see this, for example, with, um, you know, think about Star Wars. Star Wars is a Western in space. Harry Potter was literally the most straightforward orphan story arc of all time, but they're wizards. And so that's really important. So I think when you talk about Steve Jobs, there's a sort of mythology of Steve Jobs. Um, But the reality of Steve Jobs is that his most effective successes were all iterative. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and this this balance of the familiar and novel, it, it reminds me of this uh, book, Derek Thompson, uh, it's called Hitmakers, another book about creativity, and he speaks about uh, this acronym MAYA, which is most advanced yet acceptable, I believe, that's that's what it stands for, and so you're you're looking for the familiar yet novel to, to you know, have the biggest impact for creativity. And, and this is so interesting, right, because these ideas, like, you know, talking about sort of the tension of familiar and novelty, I mean, there were books in the 60s writing about this stuff, uh-huh. and so one of the things I think is most interesting when it comes to creativity is that... We know and have known a lot about how creativity works on a very practical level for decades. But we have this sort of mainstream notion of creativity that has been sort of propagated by, you know, I think about movies like Amadeus, which sort of talks about Mozart and how, I mean, it's just like a comical notion of Mozart. I mean, in the movie, you know, Mozart's three years old playing the piano blindfolded for the Pope. I mean, this is just like not the real world. And (laughs) We have these notions of Mozart and we, for whatever reason, have internalized this as like the truth and like, no, no, no. Like Mozart started practicing the piano when he was three years old under the conditional love of a helicopter father who hired him the best music teachers in all of Europe. And he wrote his first truly original piece of music when he was 17 after 14 years of daily three hour practice with the best music teachers in all of Europe. That is not the story of someone popping out of the womb playing the piano. And so I think for whatever reason, our culture, we sort of become too trusting with the media narrative around creativity, and we don't take a skeptical enough look to it. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like when you, you say those sort of things, like, oh, he, um, you know, he started at th- uh, three years old, and he created his first original work at 17. That's 14 years of, of hard, hard work. And people, I'm assuming, would, would think of Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule. But, but in the book, you you mentioned the importance of purposeful practice. It's not just putting in the actual hours, it's making them purposeful. And, and can you maybe speak about that a little more, especially for people that want to a master a, a certain area? Yeah, of course. So um, so basically, you know, one of the things, one of the most sort of popular sort of business maxims to have come about is this idea of the 10,000 hour rule it comes from Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. And this is the idea that with 10,000 hours, you can become world-class at anything. And it's based on research from a professor named Kay Anders Erickson, who's a foremost researcher when it comes to talent development and skill development. And you know, for my book, what I tried to do was not only interview creative achievers, but also creative researchers. So I interviewed um, as many as to close of all of the living major names when it comes to creativity research, including Kay Anders Erickson. Mm. And the issue with the 10,000 hours rule is that, you know, and I'll quote um, Erickson, he the quote he told me, which I put in the book, is that, you know, quote, Glywell misread our paper, unquote. And the issue is that 10,000 hours was not um, the number. 10,000 hours was the average across skills because mm-hmm. different skills take wildly different amounts of time. I mean, to become a world-class piano player these days takes 25,000 hours because people have been doing it since well before Mozart – and people start so young. Sure. And so since this is a relative judgment, what is world class, like the numbers can be huge versus he talks about other tasks. Like there's a whole sort of hobbyist community around digit memorization of like how many mm-hmm. digits of pi can you memorize? Um, and that takes about 400 hours to become world class because it's newer, less people obviously do it. And so first, 10,000 hours was the average. So that's very important. The other thing, and I think almost the more important thing is that it wasn't 10,000 hours of practice. It was 10,000 hours of something called deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. And in pedagogy, deliberate practice is wildly different than practice. See, practice is about doing something repeatedly in order to create something in muscle memory, to make something subconscious, to make something rote. Deliberate practice is about the opposite. Deliberate practice, instead of practicing a skill, like instead of playing a game of basketball, It's about breaking down that larger skill into such a tiny, tiny increment that you can keep it front of mind and actually keep it conscious rather than making it um, rather than making it rote memory. um, Instead, it's about, okay, how do we take this thing and get better at this micro skill? So in basketball, for example, it might be left handed midcourt dribbling in painting. It might be brush pressure where you practice a single stroke then try and create a mirror image of that stroke with the exact same brush pressure. And so the result is that's what allows you to, to get better at these big macro skills is actually the convergence of perfecting all these micro skills. And so the 10,000 hour rule really does a disservice because 
I think it sells short the amount of thoughtfulness that goes into becoming great. It's not just hard work. It's hard, thoughtful work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to illustrate that idea in a different way, you also mention the uh, the different brain composition of uh, London cab drivers versus uh, bus drivers. And I thought that was really interesting just because bus drivers are taking on the same route every day. They aren't necessarily deliberately practicing uh, their knowledge of the city versus a cab driver who has to go to certain discrete areas depending on what the customer wants. So that's that was another good example, I thought. Yeah, exactly. So the reason why, um, you know, one of the things that people get wrong is that, you know, we see our bodies and we get the idea that our bodies are adaptable. Like if I started eating lots of chicken, we all sort of agree. And I started going to the gym. We all agree that I'd like gain muscle. But um, the problem is that for whatever reason, when it comes to our brain, we think our brain is this like fixed asset. And that's just not true. The reality is that our brain engages in something called neurogenesis where we generate thousands of new brain cells every single day. And these brain cells are attracted, very similar sort of muscle restoration. They're attracted to the parts of the brain that are most active. And so what you find is that your brain actually adapts to the skills and the cognitive activities that you're doing. So for example, the study you're referring to is a really famous study where they found that this was obviously pre-GPS, that cab drivers the part of their hippocampus, the rear hippocampus, which is tied to visual, spatial, navigational skills, it actually gets bigger the more cabs they drive, the longer they've been a cab driver. On the other hand, bus drivers who drive the same route every single day, they could be a bus driver for two years or 20 years, and their hippocampus does not change. And so the thing that we miss is that because our brain is you know, sort of put behind the wall of our skull, we... We don't really internalize that. We can really change it, and that's actually really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And and I suppose going back to this well, this discussion and the idea of novelty versus familiarity, uh, can you can you just for the, for the listeners that haven't read the book yet, can you discuss how you came across the creative curve, what it is, and and kind of what the implications are for us? Yeah, of course. So the creative curve is this relationship. Um, of this this f- relationship between familiarity and preference where you see this upside down u-shaped relationship where um, when we're first exposed to something new because it's not familiar enough we're kind of scared of it and we don't like it and then as we're exposed to it more we like it more and more as this fear dissipates but then eventually our novelty seeking wins out and we get bored of it and then we like it less and less with each additional exposure. And so this in psychology has been repeated a lot of times, and it's called the inverted U-shape relationship between familiarity and preference, which I thought was a terrible name. <laughs> and so rather than title my book that, I titled it The Creative Curve because hashtag marketing. Right. <laughs> of course, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, you spoke with a lot of renowned people to develop the theory even more in the book. And um, can you maybe speak about one or two stories that that really exemplify how these high performers leverage the creative curve and and specifically like where where the sweet spots are on the curve and how they take advantage of them? Yeah, exactly. So um, so basically, you know, what I did for the book was I interviewed about um, twenty five of these living creative greats, Oscar winners, billionaires, like a really eclectic set of people, and I understand a consistently create ideas that are at the right point of the curve that are on the left side of the middle where you know there's sort of that optimal tension of the familiar and the novel they're familiar enough to be safe they're not enough to be interesting you know people are excited about them and what i found was that for some people it was conscious for some people it was unconscious but what these creative greats did is they became very very good at timing and how they did it well there's a lot of things they did so I, you won't go into all of it but one of the things i thought was most interesting to me was how focused these creative greats are on consumption. See, typically we talk about creators and consumers almost in opposition to each other. There's this really annoying social media meme that's like 90% of uh, people consume, 9% engage, 1% create, hashtag hustle. (laughs) And like not only is it stupid, but it's also wrong because actually the best creators are also massive consumers in their niche because they need to know, well, what will be familiar? What will be novel? What will be that right blend of the two? And so you find that these creators are actually, they go very, very deep and they consume huge amounts of specialized knowledge. They're not learning a little about a lot. They're learning a lot about a little. I talk about in the book, I interviewed Ted Sarandos, the chief content officer of Netflix. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that he did uh, as a kid is he worked as the clerk at a video rental store and he ended up watching every single movie in the store. And I'm not being dramatic. He literally went and watched every single movie in the store. And he credits that experience with a huge part of his success because it gave him this underlying taste, this knowledge of what was out there, this knowledge of what was familiar, what was different, what was playing with cliches and tropes, what had been done too many times. And so you find that consumption is probably the most undervalued thing when it comes to creative achievement. I think there's also a similar story with uh, Tarantino as well. He worked at a video store and he was consuming all of these old movies. And oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That is a fun, I will add that to my story repertoire. <laughs> now I have Google homework to do. <laughs> I think it's either Blockbuster or, or some other video store, but yeah, he consumed a lot of uh, older movies and that, that influenced how he created his own, his own films later on in, hmm. in life. Um, I, I suppose the, the question that I was thinking of when, when looking at your curve, it's, it's a really interesting idea, but how do we gauge the timing of where where we at where we're at on the curve i mean it's yeah it's it's easy to to identify all the elements and everything but say that that i want to become a film director for instance and um i have a, an idea of of changing you know ma- making a new movie in the western genre for instance how, how can i tell whether my idea is on the right or wrong side of the curve Yeah. So one of the stories I tell in the book, which I think is a really useful example, is I tell the story of the Ben and and Jerry's flavor team. Uh, And so the Ben and Jerry's flavor team is like the best job in America. Like literally you create new Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavors. And I went and I spent a day with the team. And, you know, as a lactose intolerant person, this was like kind of traumatic. But it was also really interesting because you you think of Ben and Jerry's as like this zany brand with all these crazy flavors. But they actually had a very, very process-driven innovation cycle. And the key takeaway for me was how much external input they took in throughout the process. So let me tell you what I mean. So they have these flavor gurus. That's what they call them. Great title. Uh And the flavor gurus spend all year literally consuming food trends, like seeing what's out there, um, trying different restaurants, bars, reading menus, like all this sort of stuff. And then every year they come up with a list of 200 flavor ideas and they take this list of 200 flavor ideas and they split it up and they send out an email survey to their customers, literally an old school email survey. And they ask two questions for each flavor. One, um, how likely are you to buy this flavor? And two, how unique is it? Which is basically how familiar is it and how novel is it? Hmm. And the reason why this is so important is that what they found is they just asked people the obvious question, which is how likely you to buy. Well, they end up with all these caramel salted cookie crunch flavors, which are great, but eventually people get bored of the brand. It seems stale and be over. Now, if they just asked how unique is it, they'd end up with a bunch of flavors that might actually taste good. They might be very unique, but they're not actually commercially viable. And so what they found is that by asking these two questions together, that's how they can pinpoint where an idea is. Because they want ideas that are still nascent, that by the time it actually comes out of the factory, hopefully the trend will be on the up and up. And so they actually use data and external data as a way to figure that out. And so I found that these really great creative achievers, like whether it's a company or a person, like they incorporate feedback early and often for that exact reason. Because it allows them to understand timing and understand where an idea falls on that curve. Mm-hmm. And in your experience with Ben and Jerry's, uh, speaking with their their execs and everything, was there a certain flavor that you know they initially thought wouldn't work, and then they put out these surveys and they ultimately discover it does? Was there a huge surprise that ended up being a, a huge hit? Oh, all the time. I mean, I don't have a good example of that particular case right off the bat, but. One of the things they told me that was so interesting was, you know, these the flavor gurus have a very different experience on a daily basis with food and ice cream than their consumers do, right? Because they spend all day around ice cream. So if they don't get external feedback, well, they can create things that sound good to them, but to an audience, it might sound terrible. I mean, one of the experiences I had was when I was at Ben & Jerry's, they um, forced me to try dill pickle sorbet that they had made kind of as a joke. <laughs> And like, it's amazing. Like it tastes so, so, so good actually, but like it wouldn't work. Like it's not commercially viable. We're not yet at the pickle trend when it comes to ice cream. And so there's this difference that's really important to understand when it comes to any sort of entrepreneurial activity, which is that there's a difference between 
quality, technical proficiency, sort of feature set, all these sort of things, and consumer readiness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really, really, really important is to differentiate between those two things. Right. And and just if I can segue a little bit. So we, we spoke about the creative curve itself. Uh, you spent a good amount of time in the book on that. And then the next part of the book, you, you describe the, the four laws, that, as you call them, that can help readers really leverage the, the power of the curve. And we've spoken a little bit about those laws. They're consumption, imitation, creative communities, and iteration. And there's, there's so much good information in there that it's kind of difficult to discuss everything. So I may be hoping you can contextualize these laws by you know, discussing a hypothetical. Say, say a listener is looking for the next great idea, whether it's you know, they want to become an entrepreneur or start something in their own company. Um, how do they they leverage all four of these these laws to do that? So I guess we can go one by one. Uh, yes. For, for, for so the first law for consumption. So the, yeah. Yeah. So the first, so I'll go through the four laws. So the first law is consumption. This is that idea of consuming a lot of vertical knowledge. And so the key thing here to do is you need to go out and find sources of knowledge that are highly specialized and carve out the time in your day to consume lots of them. Because this will help you understand what is familiar. The next law is imitation. And so in the book, I explain more about how to do this practically, but you find that great creative achievers, they're actually not obsessed with radical newness. They're actually focused more on the familiarity part of the equation. That's actually a bit harder to do. And so part of how they do this is they actually imitate the creatives who come before them. Mm -hmm. And it's not about plagiarizing the content. It's actually about imitating the structure because the structure allows you to create a familiar baseline that you can then manipulate and do stuff within. And so that's really, really important. Um, so that's the second one. Mm -hmm. The third one, um, the third one is creative communities. And this is the thing I found where I found that these really successful creatives, what they do is they actually are really focused on building a community of people around them. See, it's not just about, you know, this idea of being like a solo creator, for example, but it's actually also about, okay, um, who are the people who are going to help me get there? Because you need people who are going to teach you. So talk about master teachers, um, which are different than like a mentor, for example. Um, I talk about promoters who are people who lend you their credibility and reputation and actually um, you know, help you get that exposure for people to actually assess what you do. I talk about muses and, um, and how like, you need those people who are actually just going to keep you motivated. And finally, I talk about conflicting collaborators and this idea of <clears throat> you need people who actually work with you who are not similar to you. Mm -hmm. you know, so often when we find a collaborator, we look for someone who we gel with. But the most successful creatives actually are very self-aware of their weaknesses and go external to find people who can buttress those weaknesses. So that's really important. And then last but not least, I talk a lot in the book about iterations and how the successful creatives um, go through these very iterative processes where it's not just that they are um, – you know, going to that cabin writing, like I said, with the Ben and Jerry's example, it's that they're constantly consuming information. And what they do is they turn their creative process itself into a product. And they view their creative process as a product. And as a result, it makes failure a lot less scary because any failure just makes it better. Yeah. So if process is the product, the result is that the actual output matters less. And that's a very important mindset shift that you have to go through if you want to actually access these things. Mm -hmm. And would you say that, you know, the listener acknowledging all four of these laws should start with consumption first? Is this, a, is this an order list or does it matter what order you, you approach? I think, I think, I think, um, I think consumption is the, the place to start because our brain is actually pretty good at doing this itself, like the idea of innovation and divergent thinking is actually part of our right hemisphere's function. And so consuming and giving yourself the raw materials for your brain to work on is actually something where just doing that, you're going to start feeling like you have more aha moments, more quote unquote inspiration just by doing that. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that is an important place to start. And when they consume, is, is there a particular way they should, whether it's, you know, reading internet articles or speaking with people in the market, they're trying to create something in is there a it's there all a of the way? above yeah yeah so it's all of the above so basically what you want to be doing is you want to be going out there and you want to focus on specialized knowledge that's the key thing 
is you don't want to be going out and, um, you know, I think something that people get mistaken is they think they should become Renaissance people and know everything about everything. And really you want to go very, very deep on one thing. So whether that's reading a book, talking to someone, experiencing something, it's about how do you have highly specialized knowledge without actually having to go through, you know, dozens of years of experience. That is what's critical. And, and along with that, uh, I guess this is not the imitation part, but identifying those patterns and constraints that are within whatever sector or industry you're, you're trying to create in, right? Because exactly. you're going to use those as a foundation and, and the creativity will flow from actually being constrained. People may, may think that's, uh, that's kind of the, the wrong way to think about it, but that actually is the case, right? Correct. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And I guess just to talk about imitation, if I could a little, you, you also speak about the Franklin model in your book, which I thought was, uh, was really cool. The discussion of how Benjamin Franklin became a better writer and, and Andrew Ross Sorkin as well. Uh, can you maybe tell our listener, listeners uh, what, what that model is and how they can leverage that? Yeah, so basically in the book, what I talk about is this idea of the Franklin method, which is this form of imitation that creatives engage in, where either consciously or, uncon- or well, sorry, either physically or mentally, as they're consuming a piece of creative work, they're actually outlining it, and they're figuring out what is the sort of meta structure of it, right? Think about with a book, how does it open? Where does the climax lie? How does the character development work? So they're not just passively consuming, but they're actually very actively consuming. And this imitation, this sort of imitation driven um, process, this is what allows someone to rapidly learn how to create ideas of the right level of familiarity. We don't want to watch a movie that is nine hours long without a protagonist. Right. We actually like watching movies with the same old plots over and over again, but told in new and interesting ways. That is a huge part of creative achievement is becoming comfortable with that idea um, becoming comfortable with that idea of really like not having to reinvent the wheel every five seconds. Mm-hmm. Right, right. That's it's really important. And as far as the the community aspect, um, I guess maybe some listeners would think, oh, you know, that sounds great. I need these four different type of people. But say I'm I'm not as connected as as I want to be, or my network isn't as large as I would like it to be. What what advice would you give to those people? So I think that one of the key things when it comes to creative achievement is being highly running to the truth. And so, for example, if you want to be a creative achiever and you want to work in fashion, but you don't live in New York or Milan or one of these fashion centers, like you need to move or at least spend you know, three fourths of your time there. And so a lot of this stuff, it's not particularly, um, you know, magical. It's just a lot of very like thoughtful processes. Like if you want to have a stronger community of venture capitalists, well, like probably living in San Francisco is going to help. Right. And so a lot of these things are actually very practical. It's just the totality of doing all of them is so much stuff that it's not that creativity is easy. In fact, I actually think it's quite hard. It's that usually people have to have some sort of like messed up childhood or crazy parent to drive them to do all this stuff. And so if you as an adult want to drive yourself to do it, I think you have to be very eyes wide open about just how hard it is. Yeah. And, and I think at the end of the book, you say it, it you know, could take years. It's much harder than well, what people envision. And, and so is, is there a way to not necessarily hack the process, but is there a way, a way to speed it up so uh, you can see results quicker than, than uh, may actually occur, I guess? I mean, read the creative curve. <laughs> That's yeah, a good I think, start. I, I, yeah, I think, I think working within a plan is the most important thing, right? Don't just run at creativity, run at creativity with a plan. Yeah. And, you know, granted, to be creative, you have to, to act instead of consuming books. So, I mean, consumption obviously is a part of it, but you need to um, need to actually do, do your homework and everything. But do, do you have any other books that people uh, should read if they want to become more creative or improve their creativity? Yeah, I think um, a key thing is to read um, Brian Grazer's um, A Curious Mind. Mm. And I think that book is just phenomenal about how to develop relationships with you know people who are successful in creative fields. And I think that's like it just should be a central reading for anyone. Mm-hmm. Very good. And and yeah, just to, just to wrap up here, is there any any last piece of advice you'd, you'd give to people who, who may want to start a passion project or a side project yet uh, don't really know where to start? Any advice you'd offer them? I mean, be realistic with yourself that um, doing anything is going to take a huge amount of time. And that's okay. 
Well, one of the things, one of the ways I think people can think about this as a way to sort of shortcut it is do something in a new platform. Because again, we talked before about, you know, the number of hours of practice to become great at something is relative. So if there's a thing that people have never done before, it's much more easy to become world class because world class is relative. So this is why you saw, you seen social media, so many young executives because other people weren't doing it. It's what you saw with YouTube when YouTube first blew up. There's all these people who became famous who weren't doing it for that long, but they've been doing it longer than other people. Mm -hmm. And so look for those new platforms. Those are opportunities to apply your creativity to quickly jump ahead. And I think that's incredibly important when you're doing something as a side hustle where you just don't have that much time. Mm -hmm. So new platforms, but would you also say on the flip side that maybe old uh, old industries like we were saying insurance or, or law, those are also uh, good opportunities to, to be more creative? Would you argue that as well? A hundred percent. I mean, those are areas where just creativity is under underdone. And so if you're able to get creativity into those fields, I mean, you can very quickly become the sort of top achiever or the most creative person in your industry. Like I'm always fascinated by in how industry is there's like, these sort of niche celebrities, like there's like people who are celebrities in like HR technology, because there's not that many people trying to differentiate themselves there. So if you're doing something interesting and unique, that's actually a place where similar to the point around platforms, there's less people you're competing with. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, that's great advice. And Alan, thank you so much for this. I, I really appreciate it. It was a great discussion. And, and where, where can people reach you if they want to you know, learn more about you or if they want to get in touch? Um, so you can check out more about the book at thecreativecurve.com. TrackMaven is trackmaven.com, and my personal website is Alan A L L E N dot X Y Z. Very good. Well, well, thanks, Alan. This has been a real treat. Thanks, Adam. Bye. Once again, that was Alan Gannett, the founder and CEO of TrackMaven, and the author of The Creative Curve. If you'd like to learn more about creativity or strategies that will help you improve your own creativity, I'd recommend that you check out the book. It's a pretty quick read, and you can find it on Amazon or at your local bookseller. That's it for this episode of The Power of Bold. As always, you can check out the show notes and transcript of this episode by visiting thepowerofbold.com. We would also appreciate if you can subscribe to the show and write a review on iTunes. Thank you so much in advance. With all that said, I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Power of Bold. For show notes and the transcript of this episode, visit thepowerofbold.com. Feel free to get in touch by visiting our Facebook and Twitter pages. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play. We'll see you next time.